see if I can get this to uh, finish doing its thing. On one way or another. Hold it. Hold it. Gotta get this off. Because I was, I was told that this was playing too loud last time around. It was playing, and I was trying to dance and sing, and I was trying to move around, but it didn't seem like it was working. I guess the music kept playing, so I apologize for that for those of you who had to listen to it. As far as I was concerned, it turned it all the way down. I wasn't playing at all. wasn't playing at all. Couldn't hear it. So here we go again through uh, – this is going to be uh, the Industrial Revolution, part of Dosa, and this is going to be part of the expansiveness of the actual Gilded Age, the age in which money will be so important that we'll want more of it and more of it and more of it, and you'll never have enough of it. And the idea of the Gilded Age being this time in which the Industrial Revolution Part 2, remember Part 1 was going to be the one that already had kind of gone through in the early 1700s. 1800s, and then they had kind of got a jump start with the Civil War. It was that old kind of water-powered thing, but now we're going to have steam power, coal power, gas power, solar power, and we're going to have power from John D. Rockefeller's brain and sun reflecting off of his forehead. So he is, again, as we talked about before, the Mr. Burns icon for The Simpsons, this kind of richest man in the history of the world, possibly, who wasn't himself a king. And Andrew Carnegie wasn't much of a slouch himself, about $100 billion in today's money. And J.P. Morgan, they didn't have near as much money as the two of those guys, but he was able to basically control money. He was the banker's banker, the banker of all bankers who have ever banked before. And he is still the kind of the archetype of the Chase Manhattan Bank. And so we have the Gilded Age. And what we mean by gilded is very simple. It is something that is kind of pretty enough on its own. But it's not pretty enough. Wouldn't it be pretty if we just slathered it with gold and we kind of like covered it? And the idea is to take something that is already perfect and then just make it even more. So the idea for historians about the Gilded Age is this kind of age of what they call conspicuous consumption. All of them call it this. Conspicuous consumption. The idea that it's not enough to have a lot of money. These new rich that are going to be making their billions in today's money, in fact, for inflation from all this capitalism and all this industrialism, it's not enough to have enough money. You've got to have a lot of money. A lot of money. You've got to have so much money that you can basically show it off everywhere. So it's not enough to have a mansion. You've got to have a mansion that's basically kind of just slathered in gold. Come on. you got to have more, more, more. And everything's better when it's looking like gold. So somehow or another. But there's another element to the gilded age that they talk about. To gild something often takes means to take something that's kind of rotten and gross and not very good, but you slap it with gold. It looked valuable. It looked beyond perfect. So the idea that maybe there was an underbelly of America in this 1880s, 1890s, 1900 time period, that things weren't all that great. <laughs> oh, you got to worry about that. Now, the rich are getting rich and the poor are getting poor at this time period. This is going to be the time of the most extreme division between these. And we talked about this back in the Revolutionary War time period. The idea that you would have people getting wealthier and wealthier and poorer and poorer and the actual number is going to get to the point where people finally have to do something. Um, for example, they got to just kind of wake up or if they're going to have to do something, they might have to eat the rich people somehow or another. So in this time period, we have this age in Chapter 28 of all of this expansiveness and it happens again at the time period that this guy charles darwin this guy over here charles darwin is actually doing his investigation out there in the galapagos islands just off the coast of ecuador and he's beginning to notice that these birds that have been separated from the mainland <coughs> God, i got a tickle i think it's quite i really don't but, this. but anyways these birds and these turtles and all these different things have evolved over time and it becomes the beginning of the idea of the theory of revolution that you learn about in every biology class you've ever had unless you're in, in a calling non anyways you'll have learned about it one way or another and the idea that we've all evolved from everywhere well they take that idea of his and they kind of morph it into humanity at the time period and it becomes kind of this mindset of the idea of social darwinism and it becomes the foundation of almost every kkk movement out there um, is that there's a better race out there in the world and there's a lesser race out there in the world and we got to keep the bad race from being the bad race somehow or another. So it's going to be taken here in America by a guy by the name of Herbert Spencer. He's actually kind of a British guy coming over to the American kind of guy. And that is going to then start to kind of create this idea that the races themselves are constantly competing with each other. And Edward Bellamy, um, William Graham Summer, and now Edward Bellamy is another guy who's going to do it later on, talk about the idea of this being kind of the rule of the world, the science of nature, that there are better people. And it just happens to be that the best people out there happen to be white, Northern European, British, German type people. 
Well, all of this is happening at the exact same time that Hitler is himself being born and being raised. So it's the talk of the town. He's being raised in it. He didn't invent the idea of the Aryan Superman. He's raised in the idea of the Aryan Superman. And it's going to permeate everywhere, including the United States. And we'll talk about that a lot when we get to the 1920s. In this time period, it's going to actually be getting into the heads of people like Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was a very kind of big expansionist, this idea that there is going to be great nations out there in the world. He himself is going to then say that nations that expand and nations that do not expand may both ultimately go down. But one leaves heirs in a glorious memory and the other leaves neither. The Roman expanded and he has left a memory which has profoundly influenced the history of mankind. But the peoples that do not expand leave and can leave nothing behind them. So Teddy Roosevelt was big on the idea of trying to be an imperialist and expansionist. And this, again, is this idea of this time period of social Darwinism and survival of the fittest. So you have to have these kind of phrases down really well. You've got to have them in your head, ready to go. Social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. And it is the American version of kind of the AP Euros, uh, white man's burden in this time period. And so we have a lot of change in there and a lot of controversy. And as we get richer and richer and we as a nation, but it seems like smaller and smaller groups of people get richer and richer. And the mass of the people that are making the money for the richer and richer people are getting often poorer and poorer, even though prices of things drop because of industrialization. At the end of the day, a lot of people have even less and there's even more poverty. So people get asked the question, like, why was this? Well, we've been wrestling with this issue going back to the days of John Winthrop, if you remember. And the idea that maybe there's something to it. Maybe I'm more moral. Maybe I'm kind of the way it is. Now, there's also the image in this time period of something called the, the myth of the self-made man. And this is from a, a series of books that are written by Horatio Alger. He is an author who wrote um, what are known as the time period dime store novels, the factor for inflation, like a $5 book, a paperback book of today. And they were always the same kind of story. There was a young boy around the age of 12 or 13 that had kind of had been down on his luck and urchin in the streets of New York or some other city. And they would kind of not have given up, even though around them was all kinds of poverty. People were stealing. They were often the kind of guys who just had a good moral compass and they would still do the right thing. And in the particular case of Maggie Dick, he kind of like helps out a guy who's like dog or something falls in the uh, East River as they're trying to go back from Long Island to uh, Manhattan. And he saves a dog. The guy gives his money. And instead of like blowing his money on food and stuff like that, he decides to buy himself like a shoe shining kit. And so he starts shoe shining for a living. He starts his own little shoe shining business. After a while, he becomes like a multi $5 millionaire shoe shiner of sorts. And the idea that by the end of the book, he's actually done well. He's got his like little, little shoe shine company he's got, and he's hired other like young guys around him. And almost all the other stories of Horatio Alger are along the same thing. And they're always some sort of idea. But the basic idea is really simple. The rags to riches idea. The idea that you could be anything in America if you just work hard enough. And it is true. More true in this country than almost any other country in the world. But the idea of these books, Mark the Match Boy, and then you got, what was this one behind me? Sorry. Oh, Sink or Swim. That's always a good idea. You should probably swim before sinking. And then we have these other kind of <coughs> books at the time period. Uh, Feel the Fiddler, um, Struggling Upward, and then I Can't See Behind the Thing, all these different books, $500, The Young Miner, Helping Himself. These are all great stories of making it in a world that doesn't think you can. And in America, you have more chance to do that in any other place. Part of the other story of Horatio Alder is that he actually started writing books because he had been a Unitarian minister and he had been accused of some pedophilia type things and kind of run to New York uh, to kind of get away from the accusations that he never actually was taught to trial. But anyways, so the Horatio Alger myth, the myth of the self-made man, the reason why it's a myth is simply because it's often believed in America, all it takes is hard work and you can get ahead. And the idea that that's not always the case. Um, sometimes you do need a loan from your dad of $100 million just to get ahead, kind of like our current president had or J.P. Morgan had. Sometimes it's a lot easier if you can get born into an upper middle class family or an incredibly wealthy family. And the idea that all it takes, all it takes is just stick to and hard work. But there are elements of it and there are truths to it out there in the world. Oh, the boy, the cash boy, <clears throat> Rise, risen through the ranks, from the ranks, bound to rise. Anyway, so mark this down in the back of your head. But this is the mindset that is still at the time period happening. Ooh, you can barely see me. Um, the idea that this is the mindset that it's kind of science and God all put together. In the midst of a coal mine strike in 1902, you have George Bear, a coal mine owner, saying the rights and interests of the laboring man, this 
working class will be protected and cared for not by the labor agitators or union leaders, but by the Christian men to whom God in his infinite wisdom have given the control, has given the control of the property interests of the country and upon the successful man management of which so much depends. Okay. God wanted me to have this coal company. That's why I've got it. And you were going to have to figure out something else. And so what you have in this time period is kind of a, a throwback to the old idea that we looked at in the beginning of the year of John Winthrop and the city on the hill and the idea that, no, I've got money because I'm a holier person than you. And you don't because you're less holy. But if you're poor to the point of being extremely poor, it's really because of your lack of morality or maybe your race or maybe you're just basic infidelity. There's all kinds of reasons why you might be poor, but. And so we have this time period also, men who are beginning to look at it differently than this. We have, for example, Henry George with this single tax idea. And the idea was, why should somebody be able to make money off of simply owning land? That doesn't seem to make any sense that they can have it for forever. And why don't we actually tax them? And then we won't need any other kind of taxes and share the wealth of sorts. And then we had Edward Bellamy, who in his famous book called Looking Backward in 1888, um, wrote about the idea of America in the future and looking back at where they were in 1887 when he wrote the book. And the idea being that in the future, technology will have helped us out so well that we won't even need to work anymore. We'll work like a three-hour day, maybe. And that's just kind of like looking through letters and things like that. The idea that technology could help all of us rather than just the simple people that are actually owning it all was a big idea at the time period. And also leads to the question of social gospel, the idea that maybe, just maybe, God doesn't want you to be rich. That's not the idea. God wants you to be rich in spirit, rich in giving, rich in other things. And the idea that at the time period, when we start wrestling over this, we have a lot of economic kind of issues that are coming. Now, remember, the radical left are going to be people who really don't like the way the world's going and don't like the way the rules are playing. And the extreme conservative traditional uh, right are going to be the people who think it's going pretty well. So if it's going well for me, why should we change it? And we have this idea of status quo versus change in this time period. And in terms of economics, with one exception we'll talk about here in a second, it's not on the line, though, is the idea that we have feudalism, which was one of the older systems of economics. And that's the idea that the king has been picked by God and God wants the king to be the king and thus the king owns everything. Or the other extreme, kind of like guys like, you know, Karl Marx on the other edge saying, no, we should all share the stuff together. Having written his Communist Manifesto in 1848, here we discovered gold and poor people and workers discovered they have no gold. And women discovered they have no rights, so they had the Seneca Falls movement in 1848 also, the discovery year. Then we have capitalism, which has been around for a very long time. The Romans kind of mastered it. A lot of other people around the world did. And capitalism is the idea that I can either save my money and use it later, or I can spend my money and have something for it now, or I can take my capital and I can invest my money like a little seed I'm going to put in the ground, and that seed will then grow and create wealth in the future. The idea that I'm going to invest my capital is capitalism. And the idea of capitalism then leads to a breaking of the social pyramid, that you could actually start to move up the social pyramid, that if you play your cards right, you could have a whole lot more money, especially if you're a self-made man. And you all have that going for you. Yep, we also have socialism, like Bernie Sanders at the time period. Bernie has been trying you know, feel the burn socialism, although socialism isn't that super extreme, but it is distinctly Less extreme than communism, but it is more extreme than capitalism. And for the most part, socialism has gotten an interesting rap in the last bits of conversations lately. Socialism in its pure form is not communism. Communism is there's no private property. Nobody has private property, period. Capitalism means the government doesn't control anything. The government doesn't run anything. The government just kind of gets ready to fight wars, but more or less stays off to the side, passes a couple of regulations every once in a while. But under pure capitalism, it's a doggy dog world. You just get what you get. Socialism, in essence, is kind of a middle ground. And socialism is a bit of an idea that the things that everybody needs in life, the government will run it, own it, but not exclusively. For example, um, under communism, you'd have a school that everyone would go to, regardless of how much you had, because everyone has the same. Under capitalism, you only have private schools. The government doesn't run any schools. And if you can't afford to go to school, then there are no schools for you. Socialism, up until the coronavirus, was what we all do. It's what we do every day. You could be one of the wealthiest guys living up on the top of the hill, overlooking the entire Sacramento area, right over the golf course with one of the biggest, nicest views. Or you could be basically somebody who's homeless. And we have people who are financially so poor they have no homes in Granite Bay. But as a citizen living in this region, you get to go to Granite Bay High School, regardless of how much or how little money you got. It is supported by the state of California through the taxes of California. 
it is free for everybody after you paid your taxes, but you may pay no taxes because you have so little money. Now, under socialism, theoretically, it's not exclusive. You can still go to Jesuit if you want to. You can still go to St. Francis. Socialism is the idea of the things that are necessary for everybody in life. The government will own it, ro- operate it, and then run and offer it to people. Socialized electricity, for example, would be no private company running your actual utilities. Uh, our roads are socialist. You don't pay for private driving on roads. The government has it. Our police force is socialist. You support it with your tax dollars. You don't have some sort of private membership for like the police to come out to your place versus somebody else's place. Firemen. So many of the things that we've kind of been leaning towards, with the exception of health care um, lately, and that was his big thing, Bernie Sanders was, are about that. Now, in this time period, though, the actual socialist is a guy by the name of Eugene V. Debs, and we'll get to know him a little bit more um, in the next lecture. But Eugene V. Debs is going to be the socialist candidate for president five times, starting in 1904, 1900. So he's going to run 1900, 1904, 1908, 1912, 1916, and then again from prison in 1920. And so Eugene V. Debs is going to be that guy. Now, a layer down from kings are going to be things like aristocrats and plutocracies. A plutocracy basically is a government run by the rich who more or less have so much power they can make the government do whatever they want. And then somewhere in the middle of this economically is what we could call restricted capitalism or regulated capitalism. In other words, capitalism with a little bit of rules on it. And what makes the difference between restricted capitalism and socialism is under restricted capitalism, the government really doesn't own anything with the exception of maybe like some Navy yards or some army bases. But beyond that, the government really doesn't own anything. They don't run anything. Everything else is going to be run. You're not going to have like public schools. You're not going to have like electricity or things. And the champion really of that is Teddy Roosevelt, one of the like famous Republicans at the time that we'll get to know a little bit more about later on. So in this age that we're looking at, economic issues start getting discussed. And it is an ongoing thing. It's been happening for quite a long time. You take your social pyramid, you take your very, very wealthiest people at the top, just like there was the king and then Thomas Hutch and all that kind of stuff. We've talked about this. Take that and turn it on its side. And in essence, you have kind of your left, right when it comes to economics and the idea that people that are on the left are going to want to have some money of the people that are on the right. I got to go this way, that way. <clears throat> so liberal left, conservative right, and the idea of people in the moderate middle. Now, in the time period of the Revolutionary War, there were the Whigs and the Tories, Thomas Hutchins being the Tory, but then when he leaves, along with about 100,000 other Tories, it's not like they take their money with them, per se, especially in the cases of land. So you're going to have a vacuum up there, again, at the top of the social pyramid, that'll be filled by founding fathers, including guys like Sam Adams, who had pretty much blown out all of his dad's money and his brewery and everything that he inherited, and then finally found some way to kind of make some money after the war, when he now is one of our founding fathers. And the process of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer is going to start all over again. It always tends to happen. We talk about it in class. It's economic law of gravity. Nothing wrong with it. It doesn't mean that it's evil. It just is what it is. If there is a piece of property that's up for buying and I got a million dollars and you only got $25, I'm going to buy the property. And then I can do something on the property. And I can make more money. Now, if another piece of property pops up for another like $25.75, I can buy it more easily than you. Because if you try to buy the $25.75, I can say, no, I'll give you $1,000.25.75. So the idea of economic law of gravity, the rich get richer, poor get poor, is anything bad. It just is the way the world works. It just happens to be that way unless something comes in and changes it. Now, in the time period after this, we had the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and guys like, you know, Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. There's a million things I haven't done. Just you wait. Because I went from being a Jamaican boy wait over here all the way up to be one of the more powerful people in the history of the United States in terms of my importance. And we have a lot of things happening. By 1861, the richest, richest, richest people in the whole country are the ones that had basically taken over from those guys. And they, in essence, were kind of represented by the Democratic Party. And these were the slaveocracy. These were the slaveocrats. Jefferson Davis, all the way down to um, Alexander Stevens. I don't know why his face is over that poor Alexander Stevens being blocked. John C. Calhoun, don't look at his chest hair. I mean, look at his chest hair, not his eyes. Forrest Gump's namesake, Nathan Bedder Forrest, Robert E. Lee. And Edmund Ruffin's I Don't Want to Live Anymore after Robert E. Lee surrenders. Now, these guys, obviously, by the end of the war, are going to be replaced by the up-and-coming new rich that we're going to be looking at. These are people who weren't born into wealth. These are people who are going to make their wealth, and they will replace the old kind of guys. And they will be supported mostly by the Republican Party at the time period. So we have our new aristocracy, um, even though it's illegal in the constitutional system to have any titles of nobility. But our new aristocrats are basically plutocrats. That way, they're not aristocrats. They don't have a particular title, like Duke or Earl, that kind of stuff. 
That is, again, it's going to be John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan in his nose. And his nose, again, I think was absorbed by his twin brother that was in in the uh, you know the womb. And then somehow or another, he ate him. And his nose is going to be part of a sore spot. And then Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie, potato, potato, mercantilism, mercantilism. And these are going to be the guys who make and break politicians, you know, like presidents and such. So in this age of wealth, an interesting way to play this, again, I'm sorry for those of you who've watched this twice, but now hopefully the music's not playing at all, so we have it out there, is going to be the idea of just asking the basic question, how wealthy have our presidents in our past been? And our presidents that ultimately had less than about a million dollars at the height of their life, somehow or another, you know, um, we're going to be guys like James Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson, Grant, Garfield, Arthur, McKinley, uh, Woodrow Wilson, he was a history professor. Can you imagine being a person that teaches history every day no matter no wonder you didn't have any money uh warren g money pimp daddy harding and then calvin glitch and harry truman of show me missouri and then we have our other guys going to be coming in here as a different level and they're going to have a round you know 1 11 12 3 6 7 8 million he's going to be a bunch of different guys um from <clears throat> william henry harrison last the president for about a week about a month actually the robert at taft and then jimmy carter and sell some books Ronald Reagan did some movies, but never got super famous for the movies. And then moving our way up the path, I guess, beep, boop, boop, we'll get all the way up here. Um, we're going to have different guys like those guys. John Adams, his son, made a little bit more money than he did. John Quincy Adams, Grover Cleveland, the two Bushes, Obama. I'm sure Obama's got more money than that by now. I did this research about a year and a half ago. <coughs> Our next level of guys, Teddy Roosevelt's doing pretty well by himself. Herbert Hoover, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We even have Bill Clinton in there. I did not have. Anyways, we got a bunch of different guys. And then moving on farther up the line, we're going to end up going up to our big guns. Number four, Thomas Jefferson. Give me liberty and a pen to write it all down. And then we have our John Kennedy, who was going to be a inheritor of a multi-billion dollar estate when his dad, Joe, died. But he died first, November 22nd, 1963, there in Dealey Plaza. And then our bigger, numero uno. Actually, numero dos is George Washington, a huge land investor of the time period. So all of our presidents, you put them together, all of our presidents, you put them together, and the combined wealth is about worth two point two six billion. To our current president, who says is around three point three billion, but he hasn't released his taxes yet, so we don't know for sure how much he actually is worth. So this money time period is going to bring about our first big corporation. Our first big corporation are going to be the railroads, and the railroads are going to be all kinds of money. And they're going to be basically the guys who were given land by the federal government. And then from that land, they were given with all those loans that they were given at 0% interest and sometimes grants that they said, just keep the money, don't pay it back. We want you to build these railroads. We, in essence, have our first big multi-corporations that control stuff. So, yeah, we're here to see the railroad states of America. And that's like the speaker of the states of the House of America and these guys pontificating with their steam stacks. And then, yeah, the everyday farmer will do that in the lecture in a couple of days trying to say, hey, these rich guys don't have the right to control everything, like a colossus of roads standing over the in and outs coming into and out of New York City, and you could only go on the railroads that Cornelius Vanderbilt actually actually owned and ran. This is going to be tried to be regulated. The government will try to regulate the Interstate Commerce Act in 1887. If you did your reading, you found out that it didn't work very well because the Supreme Court kind of shut it down. So it's not really your place to do this. And then we have the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, um, and that's going to come along and basically also not work for a long time. And it's going to say that monopolies are illegal. You cannot have monopolies unless you're playing the game Monopoly and heaven help you if you land on somebody else's boardwalk for $2,000. All right. So these are our robber barons, our robber barons, the robbers, John D. Rockefeller, whoops, Andrew Carnegie first, and then J.P. Morgan and his twin brother, the nose. These are going to be against the everyday people that are going to do it. And America is going to stretch itself out and these guys are going to be rich. You've got to have these three guys. So Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie, and then John D. Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan, and his nose. Now, John D. Rockefeller is going to make his money by basically investing and reinvesting and getting into the game of just oil, and oil being oil, and oil being the oil that we have. The thing that makes Dubai rich is going to be the thing that makes him rich. Um, John D. Rockefeller and his life um, will become probably one of the wealthiest men in the history of the world that is not a king. Um, estimates range around 150 to 200 billion dollars in today's money. You know, fifth of a trillion. Who doesn't have a fifth of a trillion hanging around in like you know their couch and just spare change someplace? Um, what he doesn't have is hair. He had um, a form of alopecia of some sort or another, basically caused him to lose all his hair. So he always had different toupees. 
Uh, he didn't have any hair on his eyebrows, any of that kind of stuff. Um, but he was a guy who was going to be the founder of Chevron slash Standard slash Mobile. Um, and he has what was known as a horizontal monopoly. And a horizontal monopoly, just think of it this way, is when you look along the horizon, all along the horizon, when you look for a place to get gas, you can't find anything except a Chevron station, Chevron station, Standard Oil, Standard Oil, Standard Oil, meaning he controlled one part of the economic processes. And so he has a monopoly. Now, he is different than the guy who was also a self-made man, Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie, the man from Scotland that came with not much than a penny in his back of his pocket. That sounds more Irish than anything else. Anyways, Andrew Carnegie is going to be a man whose dad really had nothing. If you did your watching of the movie, you'll notice that he was in there and he came over and worked his butt off. He was a smooth operator. Started working on the Telegraph, um, made some money, made some investments. Sooner or later, became one of the wealthiest men in America. But he found that the actual places that he's going to make big money was going to be in steel. And the way he made his money, really made his money, was by creating a kind of a vertical monopoly. And his vertical monopoly meant that not only did he own the steel company, this is my hands representation, I think in American Sign Language, just means steel company. I might be wrong. But his steel company, in essence, would buy coal and would buy iron ore and it would basically buy all kinds of stuff. But instead of paying other people for it, he decided, well, I'm going to buy the iron ore mine. And then I'm going to buy the railroad that brings the iron ore to my actual steel factory. And then I'm going to buy the coal mine. And I'm going to have a railroad that brings it there. And then I'm going to have from my steel factory a railroad that takes it out to the port. And I'm going to have the ships that actually take it. In other words, I'm going to own all my own stuff. So I never have to pay anybody else any money for my own stuff. It's like mercantilism unhinged. So that's a vertical monopoly versus a horizontal monopoly. And then eventually, he's going to be big into philanthropy. He um, is one of those guys that believes strongly in the idea of the social gospel, the idea that money should be used for the good of other people. So he has no problem with the idea that God wants him to have the money, but God wants him to make the decision of where to spend the money. So he's going to be the guy that's going to create all kinds of libraries around the country um, for people in this time period. So he is one of our big guys. The success gospel is also connected to this, this idea that I am successful because I am who I am. And then you have J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, who never has anywhere close as much money as these other two guys. But J.P. Morgan has a nose, and that counts for something. As somebody who knows what it's like to have a big nose that's actually absorbed his own twin in the womb. J.P. Morgan is one of my favorites because he has a lot of money. And I hope that someday if I die and he's in heaven and there is money in heaven, he'll give me some for saying nice things about him. J.P. Morgan inherited about 10, 12, 15 million dollars in today's money from his dad to start his own business. And he got into banking and he really got into big banking, like European banking and made time connections. So he's going to be the banker's banker. And what he's going to do is basically be the money behind all these guys. Because even though Andrew Carney, has got a whole lot of money and he's buying up steel companies, he doesn't have like cash on hand. So all these big guys, all these rubber parents have got to go to banks to get loans and they will pay back the loan with interest, meaning that JP Morgan, while he's not as wealthy as the other guys, he's probably way more powerful than the other two. And he, in essence, will help set up things called trusts. And these are going to be board of directors of which on those boards, we put people he trusts to make sure that they work together so that we don't combine and control ourselves. Now, we'll talk about him more later on. But J.P. Morgan and then John D. Rockwell, Andrew Carnegie, and then Cornelius Vanderbilt, who's going to be one of those guys of area of New York and the money of the New York, the nouveau riche, the new money. If you watch the movie of the Gilded Age from American Experience, you'll have heard about him. And then these are the guys that are going to be fighting with the guys like those little, I mean, out of there, those little labor guys, the workers that are actually working in it. Now, if you ever see on these things um, in these political cartoons, um, this, what you're going to see in essence is a kind of a little um, – in and out hat, a paper hat. And those were designed to basically keep all the soot and the crap that's in the factory from getting on their head or starting their hair on fire. And then at the end of the day, you would just throw it away. So anytime you see this kind of stuff, in essence, that's what these guys are. So if you see a little guy with an in and out hat without the red, that in essence is a worker. And the only weapon he has, notice this, and this is going to be in our next lecture, is the weapon of the strike, being able to go on strike. Now, <coughs> these guys, <laughs> can't wait for this. I probably just need to stop smoking so many cigarettes each day, but I'm so sad of being stuck in the house all day long. So it's just. <laughs> anyway, so these robber barons are going to be the guys that are the money guys. They'll almost always be characterized as being big money bags. Their body is like a big mag. They got so much money. They can eat anything they want. And they got the swords of legislation and then being kind of laid at their feet are the interest of a mortgaged farm and all my wages. In other words, the American people are giving their gifts 
like the wise men to Jesus, except Jesus wasn't so big and he didn't have a beard yet when those three wise men gave him his gifts. So in essence, what you have is this kind of time period in which these guys are very, very wealthy. Now, again, this is not new. It's just picking up speed in this time period. This is kind of Industrial Revolution number two. Industrial Revolution number one really started in the 1790s up into the, seven, the Civil War in 1861. And some of the people that are making money on this are doing exactly what old Alexander Hamilton, my name is Alexander Hamilton, then he, in essence, wanted to have high trades, high tariff, all that kind of stuff. But one of the guys who actually started doing some of the first factories, making cotton fabric out of cotton coming from the solid south, He's going to basically make his own little mill town up in Lowell, Massachusetts. And these are textile mills. And the mills will have all kinds of different spots in them. They'll have their own armory so they can, like, shoot people if they have to. But they're going to have all these different mills. And then they'll have these places where the people actually work. And they live. And they eat in the commissaries. And they go to church. And so these are going to be places that are made by these incredibly wealthy people with their own little gardens and stuff like that. So that the people that are working in these places, this picture of it lately, um, 40 years ago or so. But these places are in essence going to be a place that are first water powered and the water will run by these little canals and stuff and turn all these different engines and all these different looms and the women will be working in there. And the first people working in these things with these water powered kind of looms um, are in essence women. And then later on, they're going to be other people. So the women at first are called Lowell girls. So you need to know Lowell girls. That, oh, I love you, will you marry? you got to be able to use these people. So these are the first industrial workers in America, are these women. And these are women who, for the most part, how to say it politely, couldn't get married either because their father didn't have enough money to give a decent dowry for a guy to basically say, sure, I'll marry your wife, your daughter for $10,000. Um, or they weren't pretty enough to be picked up by a guy regardless of the dowry saying i really don't care if you got money or not because your daughter is really amazingly good looking and so these are women who for the most part are going to be sold into labor um, by their fathers and most of these guys were men who had farms and they really couldn't have their girls working on the farm so they would basically sell them off and they'd have these dorms of sorts where they'd live in the dorms and work in essence and then they'd kind of eat over here and they'd go to church over there and they could walk through the garden over here and they have these kind of bells of sorts that they'd have during the time period and when you'd wake up around six you'd get to your first work at 6 30 you'd basically stop work at 6 30 so we're talking about a 12 hour day um, for these people you think you're working hard during the coronavirus time period or any of those other kind of works you have in a regular life that's what these guys do. Now, notice this is December of 1845, and this girl looks like she's very, very happy. Um, she sings songs. They sing songs. So who wouldn't l like working 12 hours a day, six days a week if you had songs to sing? The day is over and over. It's been for every time. So these low girls, for the most part, are going to be replaced over time by immigrants and then ultimately child labor in many instances. And so this is going to be part of the Industrial Revolution. And one of the first groups of a union out there saying, this just isn't right. We need to work together. As long as we're just individual workers, there's no possible way that we're ever going to be able to have any change happen. So we need to unite. We need to be a union. And if you notice up here, in essence, this idea of knowledge is power right there is not just the union, but the idea of a, do you remember this? A Beer with a bunch of wooden rods around it wrapped by a cord of unity that is the fasci that is the symbol the italian symbol for strength through unity it is the foundational symbol of the united states often it is on either side of the speaker of the house and the house of representatives and so in essence this idea is we need to unite same idea the united states and so the knights of labor will be our first really national labor union formed and officially in 1869 so in 1869, we have the Transcontinental Railroad and the two tracks coming together. In 1869, you have the Suez Canal connecting the Red Sea and also, um, you know, the Mediterranean Sea. And in 1869, you have the first set of workers trying to unite themselves, 1869. Nine. So you have, in a sense, Terrence Powderly putting these guys together and coming up with our first union. So the labor union, the first national labor union, no way, shape, or form the first union in the United States, but the one that you need to remember that is a national labor union is going to be the Knights of Labor. And they are, in essence, going to bring in all kinds of workers, unskilled, skilled, doesn't matter if you're a worker, not an owner, you get to be long for our union. And they even bring in um, free blacks from the South that are there and women, people from different ethnicities. 
except for some of the Irish, they don't like the Catholics. But by and large, all things concerned, if you're a worker, you can join our union. But it's got to be like a super secret little society of sorts. So they have their little rituals. They have their like little hammers, they that kind of stuff. But their big thing they fight for, the big, big, big thing they fight for is the idea of the eight-hour day. They're working for the eight-hour day. So we'll talk about this in a little bit. These Knights of Labor guys, they in essence are made fun of with their little paper hats. So they basically take the idea of the paper hat that workers would work with and instead this artist is obviously mocking it by giving them like little paper like crowns of sorts and so the idea of this Knights of Labor is going to be mocked by many of the different publishers and owners um, of different newspapers. The Knights of Labor are going to basically be led by Terence Powderly. He obviously doesn't want the Irish, Nina, no Irish need to apply to kind of come in and take the work and he doesn't want employers to hire these guys as scabs. In other words, Let's kick the Irish out of America, and then you won't have extra workers, so you have to pay our workers more money, and then give us the eight-hour day. So here then is uh, Come Join the Knights of Labor, or the Railway Strike Song and Chorus um, by Mrs. Ella Lodge. I'm sure you probably have it on your Spotify. We can all sing it together right now. Come join the Knights of Labor. It's been overplayed, probably. A little overplayed. Anyways, so this is the idea of this unity. Workers working together as one. Well, they get big really quickly. They go from 1869 to a peak in 1886 of about 700,000. Back in the time period where the country has about 50,000, 50 million or so, that's a lot. That's a lot of people to join the Knights of Labor. So it's incredibly powerful. And then it kind of blows up. In 1886, there is a strike going on in Chicago, just outside of Chicago, in a place called the Hay Market where he would be then bought and sold and stuff like that. And some radical speakers, including some socialists and some anarchists and some Marxists and some other ists are out there speaking. And then a shot rings out and one of the protesters gets shot by a policeman. Well, later on, all hell breaks loose. And during a speech, you can see the guy up here giving a speech like, no, no, he's free. And then firing into the land, a bomb is thrown and the bomb in essence blows up and it kills a bunch of policemen. So just like in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, when we basically have blacks frustrated, angry, pissed, not going to take it anymore, and many whites and others very similar angry, that you can't just stop a black person for a traffic violation, and all of a sudden they start being killed or shot for whatever reason. Um, in the midst of this time period, we have Trayvon Martin, and all of a sudden – the guy that killed him getting off with like self-defense just because he had his hoodie on or whatever. This in essence is a part of the story that is moving in America and Colin Kaepernick gets involved in it. He does his whole kneeling for the sake of like racial equality. And it starts to build until a Dallas protest where a sniper basically kills five policemen. And then all of a sudden we start getting this counter reaction, which is going to be part of the American story too. The idea of like, yes, not only Black Lives Matter, but all lives matter. And the guys that are out there trying to protect all of our lives deserve our honor, which they do in my mind. To me, I really – I understand politics, but I don't understand how people fall for the idea. Is it impossible for you to believe in the idea that every American, including black Americans, should be reasonably certain that just because I get pulled over by a policeman for some sort of traffic violation, then I'm probably not going to get hurt? I mean, I might get a ticket I don't want to pay for. Isn't it okay to believe in that? And that policemen should be honored for willing, willing to risk their lives on a daily basis for us? I don't understand how it has to be one or the other, but that, as we've been looking at, is what our two political parties tend to do. In our binary singularity, you got to be able to pick your side of which side of the donkey you're looking at. And so in this time period, that's kind of what's happened. And so you have people from the president to Colin Kaepernick, all kinds of things. People saying, hey, it's about the vets. And other people saying, thank you, Colin Kaepernick. And then Nike saying, we're not going to run your stuff anymore. Anyways, in 1886, when police died, five policemen died with this explosion. Um, the Knights of Labor, in essence, just now get pilloried. And after that, their membership just plummets very, very quickly, down to almost nothing by the time we get to 1893. And so the Knights of Labor are our first labor union, but they're not our last labor union. They're not our, well, not, they're our first big labor union, but they're definitely not our first first. Um, but they're not our last. We're going to have a lot of others as we go through this time period. So basically, we now have, by the 1880s, uh, with the Transcontinental Railroads, not just the one that in, you know, little Douglas, Stephen Douglas wanted, but all these others, we in essence now have uh, this kind of very interconnected 
economic system, the market revolution gone, sea to shining sea, the dream of Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. And then we have, in essence, his protege, handsome Henry Clay. Damn, Henry, you are amazingly handsome. You are handsome, man. His dream of an American system has now come to fruition by the 1870s and 80s. Uh, but it's really kind of being made on the backs of a lot of people working at the bottom of the social pyramid. We'll talk about that in our next lecture. You have European immigrants, predominantly Germans and Irish, later Italians and other people from Southern Europe working in the factories of the what will be known later on as the Rust Belt from the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to come from the seal cities of Pittsburgh. You have the sharecroppers, both black and white in the South, that are basically so poor they can't even pay rent on land, so they got to give a share of the crop, often about 25 to 50% of whatever they made, often working for the guy that they used to be a slave for. Then you have in the East and the West, you have the Chinese, Japanese, a handful of other people, not just that, but poor whites also, but basically the workers out there, and then very, very poor often, very, very poor, but they own their 160-acre land, their homestead, and they're proud, but they don't have much, but they've got their independence, and they're going to be the kind of the backbone of the Middle West. The Midwest to this day is made up of the most white overall kind of homogenous groups of Americans in the United States. The two coasts are very multi-ethnic. The middle is very much not. And then, in essence, the politics is going to be played on it. We're going to be talking about this next time, where you have the Democrats represented by Tammany Hall and Boss Tweed and the Republicans. They're going to be kind of the, uh, the party of big business. So what's going to slowly happen in this time period is the Republican Party will be the party of big business and often the workers in those businesses, the laborers, and the Democrats will become the party of the solid South still, and they'll become the party of often immigrants like the Irish and the Italians and the party of the Catholic Church and eventually the party of New York City. But we'll hit this in a little while. So they will become the movers and shakers. This is the time period, again, which there is almost no rules and regulations whatsoever on business. Just aren't. It is the best age of business and it makes us incredibly rich as a nation but incredibly unbalanced between the haves and the have-nots there has never been a time in american history in which the gulf between the small one percent or the point one percent or the point zero one percent and everybody else has never been bigger that's the time we're in right now it's pretty close that's number one and number two all right, talk to you in a while.